Hey, I'm Felissa Rose, and you're watching Keto and Crime. That, that was somebody completely different than the person you married. I would agree that that was a part of his personality that he did not share with me. Harris's now ex-wife, Leanna Taylor, grilled by the prosecution during an emotional second day on the stand, confronted about her husband's affairs and sexting with other women, including the morning of their son's death. Did he ever tell you that he'd gotten up at 5.43 a.m. around then or was awake at that point uh, messaging uh, strangers? No, he destroyed my life. Prosecutors say Harris intentionally left Cooper to die in that car because he wanted a child-free life. Taylor telling jurors his infidelities broke their marriage, the couple divorcing earlier this year. I'm humiliated. I may never trust anybody again the way that I did. If I never see him again after this day, that's fine. Hey everyone, welcome to Thought Crime and Keto and Crime. Today we've got another true crime case for you. This one's a rough one. This one happened about, oh, six years ago, and the trial was about four years ago, but it involves the uh, death of a young child, uh, a two-year-old, uh, in one of the most gruesome ways that you can imagine, being left in a hot car. Uh, as spring and summer approaches, even though we're all kind of isolated because of the COVID now, it's still something you need to be aware of. Spring and summer, you see deaths from pets and infants being left in hot cars absolutely skyrocket. And so I thought it was probably good to bring this case back out to the forefront to warn people to be extra careful, check the back seat, and don't make that very tragic mistake. Um, I know a lot of people think that parents are quite negligent when they do that, but if you actually read the statistics, a lot of parents are very tired. There are many infants that just don't sleep, so you have parents up all hours of the night, they're working, they're trying to make ends meet, and take care of a baby, and in lots of cases, they actually have what is called a preloaded memory in their brain of actually removing their child from the car and taking them into daycare or the babysitter or home or into work, wherever they are. And so they may actually think they've done it. So this, these kind of things happen. Now this particular case, I don't believe was an accident, which makes it even more tragic, but let's get into it. Justin Ross Harris was born November 27th, 1980 in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He was a very bright child, very enthusiastic, uh, loved school, loved the University of Alabama football team, as any good Alabama boy should, and War Eagle. And he, he grew up fairly normally, fairly normal, upper middle class family in Tuscaloosa. Uh, he dated in high school, they had many, many girls in high school, and eventually went on to the University of Alabama later in life to pursue a bit business degree in, in business administration and web development. In 2004, on a blind date, he met Leanna Taylor. They quickly fell in love, quickly had a whirlwind relationship. Leanna was from Demopolis, Alabama, a uh, small town in Northwest Alabama about two hours from Tuscaloosa. She was there for school as well. She was studying to be a dietitian and a nutritionist. And the two hit it off. They got married in 2006, only two years after meeting on a blind date. And she actually encouraged him to go back to school. He was currently working at the time they met as a 911 dispatcher in Tuscaloosa. So he had no, no aspirations to go back to school and she actually encouraged him to really pursue his potential and go back to school, which he did. And on the flip side, she was a very shy girl raised by a single mom, didn't really go out, didn't really socialize, and he kind of introduced her to that world, kind of brought her out of her shell, kind of made her a social butterfly and uh, 
kind of turned her from an introvert to an extrovert. So he did do that for her and she encouraged him to go back to school, which he did and pursued a later on a career in web development. After graduating from the University of Alabama, he worked several web development jobs and the couple was by all accounts very, seemed very happy, but those things can be deceiving. Leanna had discovered that Ross, Justin always went by Ross, Ross had an obsession with pornography. She caught him watching pornography, looking at pornography on the internet a lot. <laughs> Let's just say fairly, it was a fairly regular occurrence in the uh, Harris home for him to be watching pornography on the internet. Uh, in addition to that, she suspected he might have been having affairs because she, he was kind of a womanizer in high school, though he doesn't really look like the type to be a womanizer, but anyway. He was kind of a womanizer in high school, so she kind of suspected that he was still canoodling with uh, strangers and even ex-girlfriends. Um, however, in 2012, two big events would cause them to leave Tuscaloosa and kind of get away from all those bad memories. One was the birth of their beautiful little boy, Cooper Harris. And Ross would start a career with the Home Depot corporate headquarters in Atlanta. And they moved to the suburbs of Atlanta in the city of Vining in 2012. While in Atlanta, Leanna got a job as a dietitian. She was doing quite well. They did have to put Cooper in daycare because they were both working. However, Ross, because of the nature of his job, he was able to uh, actually telecommute quite a bit, telecommute quite a bit, even though it was really not what you did in 2012. So he only had to go to the office a few days a week, so he would watch Cooper some during the day. And also, by all accounts, even though they were still having marital problems, Leanna really thought that Ross was cheating on her. She had no proof of it except for the still common use of pornography, but she really suspected that. But in her own account, Ross was a great father. He doted on Cooper. He loved to do things like take Cooper to the park. He drove Cooper places. He changed his diapers. He gave him baths. Even though their marriage wasn't the best, they were great parents. And that's one thing that that everyone said about them until one tragic day in June of 2014. The morning of June 18th, 2014 started out fairly normally. Leanna left for work. It was their custom that Ross, who went into work later than Leanna, would drop Cooper off at his daycare and she would pick him up and bring him home. So she left for work. Ross picked up Cooper, put him in the backward facing car seat in the back of his was a Hyundai Tucson and left home about 8.30 a.m. that morning of June 18th, 2014. It was their normal routine. He would always stop at Chick-fil-A for breakfast, either going through the drive-thru or going in, getting breakfast for both him and Cooper. And then from there, he would drive about a block down the main fairway there, take a left and drop Cooper off at his daycare center and then come back out take his normal right and go on to the Home Depot corporate headquarters, which was literally about a mile from Cooper's daycare. So security cameras at the local Chick-fil-A in Vinings, Georgia showed Ross and Cooper Harris, both healthy and happy in the dining room around 8.57 a.m. where they purchased their normal breakfast. However, the manager on duty at Chick-fil-A that day would later say, that Ross seemed overly friendly, like he was always a nice guy, but they said that he was overly friendly, overly happy, he was kind of introducing Cooper to all the employees in the front. They were shaking Cooper's hand, shaking Ross's hand, just more friendly than, a, than he normally was. In fact, some people in the restaurant said it was almost as if he was making a spectacle of showing off his son, showing off his son that was healthy and happy. That was the that was the thought around the restaurant, and security footage does show that. 
For the first time, we're seeing pictures of Justin Ross Harris and his 22-month-old son, Cooper, shortly before the boy died in the heat. Out I said, hey, Coop, and um, just small pleasantries for 30 seconds. And then after that, I, uh, they went to sit down. After they left the restaurant. All right. Around 9.05 a.m., he exited the restaurant and is seen driving towards the Home Depot corporate office where he arrived at Home Depot at 9.25 a.m. Security cameras in the parking lot showed him exiting his SUV, walking into the corporate office and swiping in with his badge. Okay. Looking here at 925.17, is there anything in particular to this video that you pulled where we see uh, the suspect's car coming into the video? It should, it should be the top top left. Is that it right there? Um, I believe so. If you can hit play, I can see it a little yes. clearer. Okay. That time is 925.17, correct? Yes. Twelve. 15 p.m. that day, Cooper was seen exiting the Home Depot corporate office, going out to his SUV, getting in and driving to a nearby Publix where he had lunch with a couple of friends around 12.30 p.m. Uh, security cameras at both Home Depot and Publix capture the SUV in the parking lot. Now, bear in mind, little two-year-old Cooper Harris is in the back seat in the backward-facing child protective seat this entire time. He's been there, probably deceased by this point, but he has been there the entire time. So he had lunch with his friends. He actually drove to a nearby, he actually went into the store itself, bought some light bulbs, actually put those, opened the trunk, opened the SUV, put those light bulbs behind the driver's seat again never bothering to look into the child seat, getting in, drove back to the, to the Home Depot corporate headquarters, sw swapped back in and went back to work. Uh, about four and a half hours later, about 4.15 p.m., he is seen swapping out for the final time that day and leaving the Home Depot corporate headquarters heading for home. He made it about seven miles down the road when he pulled into a nearby parking lot quite erratically and immediately got out of the car screaming for help, saying that he had, his son was dead, he needed help, he needed help. Lots of passers-by heard him. Somebody called 911. They relayed that a person had jumped out of an SUV in a parking lot saying their son had, was deceased and needed help. And immediately paramedics and police descended on the parking lot. Not knowing what happened, they of course wanted to question Ross at first. However, the paramedics confirmed that little Cooper Harris was dead on arrival. There was no way that they were going to re revive this little boy. And surveillance cameras, again, he liked to do everything in parking lots, but surveillance cameras from that parking lot reveal that Ross Harris went from talking on his phone in a sobbing manner he never called his wife. That was the big thing. But he was talking to someone on the phone in a sobbing manner. He was when Anthony started CPR on the defendant's son, what did the defendant do? When Anthony started, um, the defendant stood up, uh, walked to the other side of the vehicle, and got on his phone. When the defendant, after he separated himself from the child and got on the phone, um, did he appear to be, per the witnesses, talking on the phone? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you talk to officers who actually encountered him? Yes, I did. What did they say he was doing on the phone? He stated he was telling somebody on the phone that his child had died. Now, when you spoke with the defendant, what did he say about actually speaking to somebody on the phone? He stated he had um, not gotten anybody on the phone pacing deliberately around the parking lot, mumbling to himself, and then erratically crying out, what have I done? What have I done to my son? Finally, after questioning him, the police realized that he, the Atlanta police realized he was suspect number one. They placed him in handcuffs and placed him in the back of a police cruiser where a cruiser cam caught him 
actually complaining about how tight the handcuffs were and also that he wasn't getting enough air and it was too hot in the back seat. <laughs> Yeah, buddy. Sure. We're going to do something about that. Anyway, he was immediately taken into custody, taken to the nearby police precinct. Meanwhile, closer to 5 p.m., Leanna Harris was seen pulling up at Cooper's daycare, going in to get her son, and was told that he was not there. Security footage from the daycare center shows her entering as normal in her scrubs from work, going to speak to her son's classroom teacher. Upon being told Cooper never arrived that day, she was seen running back across the waiting room and out the door trying to figure out what happened. Someone even mentioned that she said, oh my God, I hope Ross did not leave him in the car. It seemed a very strange thing to say. Now bear in mind, all those phone calls that Ross Harris made while in that parking lot none of them were to his wife which was really strange she yet did not know what happened to their son she immediately jumped in her car drove to the home depot corporate headquarters went inside there was a lot of people in the lobby paying attention to the television sets there was a lot of police around there roping things off talking to people and she actually went up to a police officer told them who she was wanted to know what was going on she was looking for her husband her husband was not answering his phone once the police confirmed her identity, they took her into a private area inside one of the offices there and told her that her son was deceased and what happened. According to the detectives on duty, her demeanor, though she was upset, did not reflect what they would expect a mother that had just been told their child was dead would put forth. While you and Mr. Dudley were working at the computer station looking at the records, did you take notice of what Ms. Harris was doing? Yes. If you could describe. She was sitting down at that point, um, just, you know, like she was just cold. Like she had, when she walked in, she had emotion. When she, you know, as time passed on, emotions faded away. And she was sitting there. And did that ever change during the time that you were able to observe her that afternoon? Her emotions? Yes. Her emotions changed drastically because when she first came in, she had a whole lot of steam. And as time went on, her emotions died out. It was like, hmm, oh well, she was just sitting there like nothing happened to me. As a parent, you lose a child or you see some breaking news or something. You were full of emotions. She didn't have any at that point. She was just there and nothing. She didn't say nothing. She didn't scream. She didn't cry. She didn't show any emotion. So it just seemed very strange to everyone. Now, temperatures in Atlanta that day had peaked at well over 80 degrees, which means the temperatures inside that car were well over 90, well over 100 degrees by the time the car had heated up because a car is a hunk of metal. It's like leaving a metal box out in the sun. It's going to get hot. It's like an oven. So you can only imagine what the temperature in that car was when young Cooper was trapped inside. And there was absolutely no ventilation. He did not crack the windows or anything because he said he thought the SUV was empty. So, yeah. Um... Draw your own conclusions, but I am going to insert a clip here of a doctor, actually a vet, talking about how temperatures get hot for pets left in cars with ventilation. So you can only imagine that the same thing would apply to a baby in a car when there was no ventilation whatsoever.
windows crack down about an inch. So let's start a timer and let's see exactly four degrees, 95 degrees. So it's pretty hot in here, but we're just getting started. So let's just kind of sit back and see how it feels in here. Okay, I'm at five minutes in. It is unbelievably hot in here. We're nearing 100 degrees already. And I can tell you that it is stifling in here. Even with all four windows cracked, there is no breeze at all. It is entirely still in here. It, it, uh, it's oppressive. I mean, that's the best word for it. If, and 10 minutes in, I'll tell you, it is almost unbearable. Uh, at this point, the temperature is about 106 degrees. So, I mean, it's, it's just getting to the point now where I can barely stand it. Uh, there's a breeze outside and it's very frustrating because it's skating down my face and nose, my lips, um, and I can do that. A dog can't. A dog can't perspire. I mean, the whole point of this exercise was really to see what it feels like. What, what would it feel like to a dog to be stuck in a car? You know, you're helpless. You have no control over what's happening. You don't. Sorry, this one's tough. This one's tough. So they immediately took Leanne to the nearby police precinct where Ross had been put into an interrogation room. She was allowed to see him. They were seen consoling each other. But again, security cameras caught her actually asking him, did you say too much? And I'll play that footage here. <laughs>
So very weird, very weird indeed. Uh, no charges were ever filed against her. They didn't find that there was enough evidence to show that she had anything to do with this. So all their investigation was kind of pinpointed on Ross. Now, for the most part, Leanna stood by her husband and said there was no way he would have intentionally done this to their son, except towards the end. Uh, this was a two-year investigation. The trial did not take place until 2016. And towards the tail end of the investigation, a lot of stuff about Mr. Ross Harris came out. Now, they did bury Cooper about a week later at a memorial service, which was closed casket. She, uh, Leanna was overheard saying that she knew her son was in a better place, which is very common. But also she said she would not want to bring him back because of the type of world we live in. I don't really get that. I think the woman was just shell-shocked and maybe she was accepting the inevitable that her husband had murdered her son. But I don't know why she would why she would say that seemed very strange. But toward the tail end of this investigation, a lot of stuff about Ross started to come out that even Leanna didn't know or only suspected. First of all, porn addiction. They took his hard drive of his computers at both work and home and, of course, discovered a lot of downloads of all kinds of porn, and I'll leave that to the imagination. He was, of course, let go from Home Depot as a result of this investigation. And on his phone, they actually found a series of text messages through an app called Whisper. Now, Whisper is an app that you can download. It does everything anonymously. You can put things out on message boards anonymously. You can text people anonymously. So they would never know your real name. And he was found to be actively texting and communicating with many women of all ages, even a couple of men, as well as young underage women. He was, it was shown that he actually sent uh, pictures of his privates to a 15-year-old girl all through this app, and they were able to trace this back from him using an IP address and, you know, kind of petitioning for cell phone records. Uh, during this time, Leanne also confessed that she suspected he was having an affair. She even suspected he had had an affair in their own home by bringing home a prostitute. He was known to, he was found to have been communicating and hiring prostitutes. And he would bring these prostitutes back to their home and actually have an affair and actually do the deed in their living room when Leanna was out of town visiting her mom with Cooper. So, Turns out Ross wasn't the good old boy that everybody thought he was. He he had some problems. Uh, the entire time Ross maintained his innocence, said he had no idea his son was still left in the car. He would never have done that. But some things kind of played against him. Number one, his behavior when he discovered the body, uh, the going between blaming himself and calling people sobbing. Also, he had lashed out at some police officers who were trying to talk to him, but he said, my son is dead. What do you expect? And there was actually some, sh you know, some shoving and aggression there. Also, the fact that the Home Depot footage revealed he had gone out to his car for a second time during the day to go to Publix to eat lunch, had gotten out of his car at Publix, back in his car at Publix, as well as actually putting purchased light bulbs in the back seat of the car. Detectives were fair and well convinced because of the odor in the car when they got there, and this is after the doors were left open while he was frantically running, that the smell of death was heavy in the car. And there's no way that that smell would not have been there during any of those times that Ross was seen exiting and entering the SUV. So they figured they had a slam dunk here. And even though they ruled out Leanna, as a suspect, they did convict Ross on November 14th, 2016 of malice murder, which means basically first degree murder without the full intent being proven. So they called it malice murder. And he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And this is where he sits in Georgia. 
Um, in February of 2016, Leanna actually filed for divorce, divorcing Leanna, divorcing Ross and going back to her maiden name. She has since returned to Demopolis, Alabama and is living there where she is currently trying to move on with her life. She is dating some new people. She has been very vocal uh, in her crusade to prevent this from happening to other children. She does a lot of work and talks for organizations that try to prevent this from happening to children even by accident. So, and she also has said fully out that she was not herself during this, as you can imagine, she had just lost her son. And that after years of being with Ross, she was not the woman that she is today. She said that she was completely brainwashed, that Ross had ruined her life and she was not a whole person at the time this was going on. I mean, you can draw your own conclusions. There is no verifiable proof that she knew anything about it. The only thing that I questioned was what she said to him in the interrogation room about, did you say too much? And after further research, I found that she did answer that question in court by saying that Ross was the type of person that always had to be the smartest person in the room. So she was just scared that he had tried to be a big shot by doing the police's investigation for them and that's why she said that so you can draw your own conclusions based on the things i read about ross that's probably true so that's where we uh, that's where we leave this case a uh, beautiful young blonde, blonde haired blue-eyed boy is dead and have a mother's whose life has been torn apart and a father consumed with uh, porn and obviously sex addicted and not wanting to be in his marriage decided to get out of the responsibility of fatherhood in a way that is not even imaginable. Uh, in fact, some of the messages that he actually was seen sending on Whisper actually talked about, I love my son and all, but sometimes being a parent is too much. So draw your own conclusions. I think they made the right decision here. I'm glad he's off the streets and will never do this to another person. Anyway, guys, that's today's case. I'll be back soon with another. Thank you so much. If you want to support the channel and the podcast, got a uh, links down below for that. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Keto comic.